Please join with me in prayer. Lord, we do ask that you would graft into our hearts such love that we would see your love and be grateful and take true account of the great gift that you've given us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. What I'd like to understand, said the ghost, is what you're here for, as pleased as punch. You, a bloody murderer, while I've been walking in the streets down there and living in a place like a pigsty all these years. This is a little hard to understand at first, but it's all over now. You will be pleased about it presently. Till then, there's no need to bother about it. No need to bother about it. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? No, not as you mean. I do not look at myself. I've given up myself. I had to. You know, after the murder. That's what it did for me. And that was how everything began. Personally, said the big ghost with an emphasis which contradicted the ordinary meaning of the word, personally, I'd have thought that you and I ought to be the other way around. That's my personal opinion. Very likely, we soon shall be, said the other, if you'll stop thinking about it. Look at me now, said the ghost, slapping his chest, but the slap made no noise. I'd gone straight all my life. I don't say I was a religious man. I don't say I had no faults, far from it. But I had done my best all my life, see? I had done my best by everyone. That's the sort of chap I was. I never asked for anything that wasn't mine by rights. I wanted, if I wanted a drink, I paid for it. And if I took my wages for a job done, I took my wages for the job done, see? That's the sort I was. I don't care who knows it. It would be much better not to go on about that right now said the other. Who's going on? I'm not arguing. I'm just telling you the sort of chap I was. See, I'm asking for nothing but my rights. You may think you can put me down because you're dressed up like that, for the man was dressed in a white robe. But you weren't when you worked under me, and I'm only a poor man, but I've got the same rights as you, see. Oh no, said the other. It's not so bad as that. I haven't got my rights, or I should not be here. You will not get yours either. You'll get something far better. Never fear. That's just what I say. I, have, I haven't got my rights. I've always done my best, and I've never done anything wrong. And what I don't see is why I should be put below a bloody murderer like you. Who knows whether you will be, said the other. Only be happy and come with me. What do you keep on arguing for? I'm only telling you the sort of chap I am. I only want my rights. I'm not asking for anybody's bloody charity. Then do so at once, said the other. Ask for the bleeding charity. Everything is here for the asking and nothing can be bought. That may be very well for you, I dare say, if they choose to let you in, a bloody murderer, all because he makes a poor mouth at the last moment. That's their outlook. But I don't see myself going on the same boat as you see. Why should I? I don't want charity. I'm a decent man. And if I had my rights, I'd have been here a long time ago. And you can tell them I said so. The other shook his head. You can never do it like that, he said. Well, we might see the attitudes of Jonah and the workmen or laborers in the reading of the gospel passage today as somewhat obscure, maybe even absurd. C.S. Lewis's writing of that passage in The Great Divorce brings things a little closer to home. Who goes before you in the kingdom, brother or sister? Are you okay with it? 
the scriptures today deal with two things. Number one, of the kingdom of God and the Father's love and grace. And number two, our fallen human response to that love and grace. But he's the solution for both. Now, if you know Matthew's Gospel, maybe you have your Bibles open to the passage. What comes just prior to this? I hope someone has their Bible open to Matthew 19. What comes just prior to today's Gospel that Jesus tells this parable? Anybody know? Well, in Matthew 19, 28 through 30, the end of the last chapter, Jesus told the twelve that he, the Son of Man, will sit on his glorious throne, and that they, the twelve who remain faithful, will also sit on thrones. Then he tells them this story. So this comes right after that discussion. What do you think he's trying to tell the church, Catholic, the twelve, and you and me? In Matthew's Gospel, the Lord Jesus himself tells the twelve what? Look with me at today's Gospel. Verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Let's stop there for the moment. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven here, he's not talking about that place that you go to when you die, right? That's a common misconception. If you're familiar with what goes on in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of our Lord. It is the presence of Jesus. And Isaiah in chapter 5, the image that's used here, the vineyard, is not talking about the great beyond, but talking about God's people here and now. Of course, Jesus is talking about the here and now back in that first century, but it applies to us too. Also, later in chapter 22 of the same gospel, Jesus uses this same terminology, the kingdom of heaven, to talk about the great banquet, that the kingdom of heaven has come near, he says. Jesus is speaking to the twelve about their work going on in real time, and by extension, ours going on in real time too. We're working in the vineyard today. They were working in the vineyard then. That was their appointed time. Today is yours and mine. And so the kingdom of heaven, friends, is going on right now in Matthew's parlance. The first thing that Jesus teaches them is that the kingdom of heaven is what in that first verse? Perhaps it's so familiar that this is lost upon you. But it's an extension of the Father. An ex extension of the Father. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers from the vineyard. Who's the master? God the Father. The first thing he teaches them is that it's all about the Father's will and the Father's rule. And the Father is constantly calling us to a joyful labor. The laborers and the workmen, immediately in the story, are the twelve. But then by extension, the seventy-two disciples and each person who's commissioned and later baptized is hired. Notice the master's words in verse 4 about their pay. They agreed to a denarius, and he says, Whatever is right, I will give you. They each agree in their various shifts, because that's what we're talking about here, shifts of the day, when we talk about the watches or the eleventh hour, things like that. They each agree to come on into the master's workforce. But at the end of the day, the master instructs the foreman to give each man a denarius which was agreed to by the first group, and it was a common rate for the day's work. Look at verse 8 again with me. He instructs the foreman, and when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. 
And we know the master is up to something, beginning with the last and ending with the first. But of course, if you know this part of Matthew, you know this phrase comes up again and again and again. The last shall be first, and the first will be last. In fact, today's story ends with him talking about the kingdom of God, saying in verse 16, that very line, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. What does that say about the Father? Well, as usual, there are layers to it, a great many. The first layer, however, of this is referring to the patriarchs and the prophets of old in Israel, the original tenants of the vineyard. Jesus has just made an amazing statement in this context prior to this passage that the twelve faithful, the twelve apostles that are faithful, right, because Judas kind of gets replaced at the end there, are going to sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And what the Father is saying here about the twelve is truly mind-blowing for you if you're a Jew. You mean that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than Abraham and the patriarchs? Well, Jesus himself talks about the least in the kingdom of God being greater than John the Baptist and says there was no greater man than he in the Old Covenant. And yet, do you see the promise? Do you see the payment that the Master seeks to give? Due to their status in the New Covenant, due to no merit of their own, as we talked about last week, right? No righteousness of their own. The least in the kingdom of God is greater than the patriarchs and the prophets because of what Jesus has done. The thief of the, on the cross is greater than all the patriarchs and the prophets because of what Jesus had done for him. And what does Jesus do? Well, by his cross, by his passion... By his death, his resurrection, by the means of our baptism, he has made us a member of his very self. We participate in the personhood of Jesus Christ by grace. And that is greater than Abraham and Moses and anyone who's come before both Galatians chapter 4 and Hebrews 3 make the point that Jesus is the pinnacle of God's plan of salvation. The closer a person is to Jesus, you see, the better. That's why Salome, the mother of James and John, asks in the very next passage, right after this, right after today's gospel, she asks whether her sons, James and John, consider Jesus' right and left hand. Because to be closer to Jesus is to be closer to the seat of power. To be closer to the seat of goodness. But what she doesn't understand is that it's not just about power, but that it is about goodness. And what we so often don't understand is that the kingdom of God is about love and grace more than it's about power and authority. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven does not run on achievement. It doesn't run on political connections like this world. It doesn't even run on competency, if we're actually honest about it. But rather, it runs on the Father's love and grace. Look at our opening collect today. It's a powerful one. It's at the beginning of your scripture uh, insert. O oh Lord, you have taught us that without love all our deeds are worth nothing. All stop. Without being connected to the author of love, without his love being poured into our hearts, anything we do, whether charitable, virtuous, is worth nothing. But, thank God, that's not the end. Send your Holy Spirit, we continue to pray, and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of charity, the true bond of peace and of all virtues, without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Again, the Cox is reiterating this point. 
to grant this for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. This teaches us that God dispenses his love and grace lavishly to those who are humble enough to ask for it. But there's another lesson, a darker lesson, in this passage. Look at verses 13 through 15. And that is our response to God's grace when we're left to our own devices. The grumbling servant. The ungrateful laborer. But he replied to the ungrateful laborer, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with the, what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? The worker's reaction is not that he's been cheated. He thinks he's been cheated. But he hasn't, right? They agreed for a denarius. And yet when the master gives those that come later in the day the same pay, he feels that he's been cheated. It's not right. It's not fair. We'd condemn such behavior in a two-year-old or a four-year-old. And yet, we feel this way all the time. In fact, one might argue that our culture runs on this. You see, the worker's reaction The world's reaction is a fallen and sinful one. It's the result of a warped human nature. There's something hidden in the Greek text that doesn't come out in the English standard, but interestingly comes out in the authorized version, the King James. Here's how it reads, verse 15. It's not lawful for... Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? Is thine eye evil because I am good? And of course, the answer is, in our unregenerate, unsaved state, yes. Yes. The evil eye is one of judgment and envy. If the eyes are the windows to the heart, the evil eye shows a hardened heart. The first worker could have rejoiced that the master was being generous with the abund- and abundant with the last workers, right? He could have said, good on you. Let's go have a beer. But what does he do? He grumbles. It hasn't cost the first worker anything that the master has been generous with the last crowd. But it upsets the first workers. Because, they're, because the master's generosity and grace is given to the last workers in the same amount. It's not fair. I should have had more. That same evil eye is what ensnares Jonah too in our Old Testament reading. I don't know if you caught that. There's a powerful theme here in the readings. God chooses to lavish love and grace on the Ninevites, the enemies of Israel. And through Jonah, a prophet, for goodness sake, God offers them the ability to repent. And miraculously, they do so. Is Jonah happy? No. Is he pleased that God's been gracious and loving? No. Look at verse 4. Jonah was displeased exceedingly. Indeed, he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is it not... This, what I, said, what, what I said when I was yet in my country, that's why I made haste to flee for Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better to me, for me to die than to live. Whoa. And yet that's what we see in the human heart, friends. It's not been made regenerate by the Lord. Perhaps we see shadows of it in our own. 
Jonah is angry for God showed mercy and used him. And Jonah and the Lord have an interesting conversation here at the end of the book. And finally the Lord says in verse 11, And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? I was always struck by that last line, and also much cattle. Like, what, what do the cattle have to do with it? But when you think about it, what's the Lord saying here? What's that, Father? What they're worth. Yeah. The cattle themselves are creatures of his whom he loves. Whom he loves and cares about. The Ninevites he loves and cares about too. And, no, and Jonah has no right to be angry or ungrateful for what the Lord has given him and what the Lord has given the Ninevites. In conclusion, dear friends, how very much sin distorts our vision, even as those who are baptized and regenerate in the Holy Spirit. It still does, let's be honest. How much our bentness blinds us to the kingdom of God. How much our pride keeps us from seeing the graces of his love and the nature of the Father. Jesus' points, Jesus's point to the disciples is this. First, it's a reiteration of the message that was given to Isaiah 55, in, in chapter 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. We do not see the full plan of the vineyard here on the earthly church. If the twelve couldn't see it, we can't see it. And if that's true as Christians, we don't see God's full plan even for our own lives. Oh, we like to think we do. We like to predict and plan and save and all of that is okay. As long as we realize that we don't see the fullness of what's going on. Secondly, God does not intend his kingdom to look like the world, nor to function it, but function like it. He will bring it about, not us. We're just able to participate in it by his grace. And so when we make it about us accomplishing, us part and us uh, accomplishing it, building it, yeah, I hesitate to even use those words because so quickly pride nests in there and it becomes about our efforts instead of our participation in Christ. We all do it. We must remember that it's his work and that he's called us into the vineyard and he's paid us the ultimate reward to be part of his team to be part of his work by participating in him. When we serve, whether in leadership or as workhorses of ministries in the church, the pride and the responsibility one rightly puts in his own work is not rightly his own. It's God's. For that too is grace. Serving the church in any way, is an extreme honor because it means God's called you into the vineyard. Whatever you do, in whatever hour you come, maybe as a babe, as we baptized one last week, or on one's deathbed. But beware of the evil eye. Beware of envy and avarice, which comes like a thief and robs you of your joy. The first workers didn't lose their salvation, but they walked away from the vineyard. So we don't know what happened to them. And we know for certain that they lost the joy of work. How many of you have from time to time begrudged the generosity of your Lord? I know I have. Finally, dear friends, imitate the saints like St. Paul, who had realized that the love of God is so much of that gift to him. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
It's a short phrase. But think about what the Holy Spirit had done in St. Paul's heart by His grace to change that heart from a man who persecuted the church to go and offer himself, his very body, as a living sacrifice unto the Lord and to be able to say those words honestly in the midst of great suffering. You have that same Holy Spirit. And even in our worst times, you and I have been given everything. If you fall ill tomorrow, if we face real persecution, nothing can rob you of the deep joy that comes along with being called to work in the vineyard, except the evil eye. And so, don't be like the first ghost that we opened the sermon with, wanting your rights, but plead for the bleeding mercy of Christ. Accept it. And whether a murder or a harlot precedes you in line, walk to the mountain of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.